with Truth to Heart Ministries. We are wrapping up our Bible conference here at Southside Baptist Church, and we've been interviewing most of our speakers. I think there's a few that got away from us, but uh, we've had a wonderful time here. I would invite you to tune in to Southside Baptist Church's YouTube page or our Facebook page where you can find all of the sermons from our Behold Our God conference. Our final speaker of the afternoon was is Matt Keller. Matt Keller is the pastor of Cross Point in Columbus, Ohio. And Matt has uh, has brought our final message, God revealed in Christ. And so I wanted to introduce him, and we wanted to, to talk a little bit in this podcast. And Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, uh, what you're doing in Columbus? Sure. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here, Jonathan. It's been a privilege to be part of this conference. It's been a privilege to be among the speakers. And my heart is just full after hearing these guys. It was just a, a great topic to focus on the attributes of God and then to be given the privilege to wrap it up today uh, with focusing on God revealed in Christ was good for me. It was good for, for my spiritual life and development to just look and, and consider just the vastness of that topic specifically and realizing that in a 40, 45-minute message, you can only just touch right. the hem of it you know, and, and not really grab on to everything there is to know. And you can spend a lifetime and never exhaust that topic. So... I appreciate your confidence in me and allowing me to do that. Um, I have been pastoring the church that uh, I'm at right now, Cross Point Church in, in Westerville, uh, for almost 16 years. It'll be 16 years in December, and um, it's been really a joy of, of my life to be part of that. I've been in uh, full-time vocational ministry now for it'll be 25 years wow. next month. Uh, God has blessed me with a wife of 28 years and three children. My oldest lives in Louisville, Kentucky with her husband and my granddaughter and another grandchild on the way. And uh, they've been married for a few years, and um, they're faithful in their church. They love the Lord and serve Him. And the only thing we wish is that they were in Columbus and not Louisville. Right. It's three and a half hours away for us. But um, my middle son is a student senior at Cedarville University. He's okay. studying mechanical engineering and getting married in December. And so we're going to add a daughter-in-law to our family we love her to death. And then my youngest daughter, Megan, is 20, and she graduated high school and trying to figure out exactly what it is that God wants her to do. And so she's living at home and working full-time, uh, serves faithfully in the church, active in our young adult ministry. And uh, so God has been very, very gracious to to us and, and given us really a, a life that we could never have expected or certainly don't deserve. Amen. Well, you know, I, we, just before we hit the record button... Um, <laughs> But before we were, I, I said, I said we, we're organic here. We like to just whatever is on our mind, but we want to stay on track. But you did mention that your sermon was God revealed in Christ, or either I mentioned it one. And at Truth to Heart, we we our whole premise is finding truth. What is truth? Where is truth? We of course we know where truth is, but we we don't want to. S- sacrifice truth for the sake of tradition or for the sake of, of feelings or, or what we've always been taught. With that said, we did through our podcast several months ago, we went through the attributes of God, which is what we've been doing here at this conference, but we never really did deal with the attributes of God revealed in Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's what you brought before us today. And you made some comments about things to avoid, you know, and you can get into that here in a moment. But you made some comments on how the attributes of God are revealed in Christ. And and I want you to, for our listeners who may not listen to that sermon, or I would direct you to that, because you talked about how Christ's life in John 1, full of grace and truth, and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. Mm-hmm. And the way you explain that, I, I really, honestly, and I've been a pastor for 15 years, I've preached through that text, but the way you explain that in connection with God's attributes, I think it was very thorough and very good. Could, could you describe a little bit about that? Sure. Um, 
of course, when you start studying a text to preach it, one of the you ask a lot of questions of the text. You know, what is it? What does this mean? What did John want us to understand? What did John want us to know? And so, we when he wrote, we beheld his glory, uh, glory of the first only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I wanted to know what that meant, and so you start looking at the words we beheld, uh, we gazed um, amazingly into his presence. Um, the idea is that it was a gaze that uh, was revealed by the Spirit, which we eventually got to in the message, towards the end of the message, Mm -hmm. that you can't see the glory of God in Christ apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that opens our eyes to that. Um, But when we got into the idea we beheld specifically His glory, what does that mean? And so we just started to trace it, I started to chase it through the Old Testament and uh, brought it into the New Testament. And it really, uh, the glory of God, as, as Travis mentioned, is you know the the sum of his attributes. It's not all of who he is, but it's a summary statement. Right. This is this describes in some way God. Um, and so we looked at that. We looked at the, the the manifestation of the Old Testament through the Shekinah, the glory of God that Moses experienced, uh, the cloud that came and, and settled on the the tabernacle, the, the the fire that came, or the the presence of God, the glory of God in the temple, um, and. That couldn't have been any of that, and so then we go to the transfiguration. And okay, so John was there, and there were others with him. We beheld, so this mm-hmm. plural. Um, was he talking about the transfiguration? And there's going to be some argument about that, but I didn't think necessarily that that would necessarily fit all of the disciples and those who believed in Christ. Yeah. They weren't all there, and they don't. They didn't all see that. Yeah, only three. Only three could see it. So it had to be something different. And so then you start to walk through and say, okay, what are the attributes of God that Christ displayed on earth? And so you start to walk through his omnipotence and how he had power to raise the dead and give sight to the blind, the deaf to hear, um, the mute to speak. Uh, You go through his omniscience. Time and time again, the Bible reveals that Jesus knew their heart. Mm -hmm. Um, You go into... Uh, his sovereignty and how he controls the wind and the waves, how he uh, spoke and things happened, took place, even power and rule over demons. Um, and so just walking that through, then it's we have the attributes of God, and then we have the visible manifestation of those attributes in play in Christ and through his life and ministry. Mm-hmm. And it, it then, I think, hopefully, kind of clarifies a little bit what John meant by that because these men who believed in Christ and followed him, and not just the disciples themselves, but other the other of those who, who followed Jesus also, they saw these things right. as well, and they believed in him. Right. Yeah, no, I thought that was a very, a very good way to describe what that means and how, because there's, what is the, what is the, the heresy when Jesus emptied himself? In our King James, it'll say that he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And I believe that that, obedi- that word obedient links with made himself of no reputation, which other versions would say he emptied himself. Mm-hmm. And so there is a heresy that, that, that thinks that when he emptied himself, that he emptied himself of his godness, of his deity. Right. Um, but we at least I believe, and I, and I believe I'm in good company, do not believe that. I think that would be heresy. Yeah. And I think everything that you just said proves that mm-hmm. because only God could live that perfect life. Only God could raise the dead. Only God could do those things. Right. But that in he made himself of no reputation, he emptied himself in that he became obedient unto the will of the Father. Right, yeah. So I fully agree with that, fully support that, and I and reject the idea that he emptied himself of any of his divinity. Uh, he did not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's important that people understand that and realize that, that when we are dealing with Christ, we are dealing with one who is fully man and fully God, mm-hmm. uh, two natures united in one person, uh, but not fused. And so it's it's incredibly important that our, our Christology is right. Mm-hmm. and Otherwise, we're, we're not going to see God the right way through Christ like he intended. Right. And I think that, and that's the other word that you use during your sermon that they are not fused. In the hypostatic union, 
Um, it is not. It's not half and half. Mm-hmm. It's not. It, but it is two distinct natures in in Christ. Yes. And again, it, it's just like the Trinity. It's not something that we're ever going to understand. And I think Alva mentioned that in his sermon. I can't believe. It, but he dealt with the incarnation. He did. And you know, how, how can we answer how we're justified? How all of these things? We know what the Bible says, but ultimately, these things are a mystery. Yeah. And it's a the incarnation is a mystery. The hypostatic union is a mystery. The Trinity is a mystery. And I tell our church oftentimes, don't don't get wrapped up in trying to understand it because you're not going to. In right. fact, if you could understand God, you would be God. Yeah. Uh, but but when you when you talk about the fullness of the Godhead bodily or the fullness of deity bodily in Jesus Christ, it's very important that we for our for our doctrine and for our I believe for our salvation that we understand that Christ is divine mm-hmm. and Christ is the only place that we go to to see who God is. And you gave some examples of other places that people go to and looking for the character and who Christ or who God is. Yeah, I, one of them I actually had my notes and took out, took it out and ended up going there anyway. Um, but I think it's it's a popular thing. I know I've had conversations in, in the church that I'm privileged to pastor with members and, and warn them about shows like The Chosen. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing about it is visible media whether it's streaming, movies, television, it's extremely powerful. And, and what it does is it, it trains us to think of Jesus in terms of what you see right. on the screen. And so when you read the Gospels and you read when Jesus is speaking, all of a sudden you're, you're hearing Jesus in the voice of the, the guy who plays Jesus in The Chosen. When you're envisioning Jesus, you're, you're seeing the guy on the screen. Right. And that guy is just a man. Mm-hmm. And just a sinful man. And he is in no way a right or accurate representation of Christ, or does he show us God? And I think people, and I've heard this argument, and I mentioned it in the sermon. Well, the show just helps me to see Jesus in a different way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's bad. Absolutely. We're not about seeing Jesus in a different way. And the Word of God is sufficient to show us Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people all the time, you want to see Jesus get in the Word because He is the Word, and the Word reveals the Word. And um, But like I mentioned in the message, it's just easier to flip on uh, your your television or your computer and and watch an hour-long program and say, well, now I know more about Jesus. I wouldn't recommend anybody, and I've I've heard this argument as well. Well, for an unchurched person or an unbeliever, it's good to familiarize, you know, so they become familiarized with who Jesus is. And again, they're not becoming familiar with who Jesus is because that is not a good representation yeah. of the sinless Son of God, the glorious Christ that we worship. And so I'm I don't want to sound like you know one of these fuddy duddies necessarily, but the reality is I I don't think that. Uh, the Chosen has any place among God's people. I, I don't think that God's people ought to be watching that. I don't think we should be admiring the work of the writers and the producers. Um, you know, they, in some ways, sacrifice the, the divinity of Christ to focus on the humanity right. of Christ, and we ought not, we should never ever do that. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's the argument that I've gotten. Same thing. I don't encourage anybody. In fact, I've been verbally speaking up against the chosen since the beginning. Yeah. Because on the very premise that first of all, it's just like with any Holly. It's like with a Hollywood ap- adaptation of, of of a book. Any book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, the book is the original author's intent. Yeah. And what he says, that's the, what the character is. And inevitably, you go to watch the movie, and it, well, you know there's similarities, and maybe even mostly right. Mm-hmm. But if you've read the book, you're looking at it, and you can tell, no, nah, that wasn't right. That's not how it was written. Right. And so why would they do any different with Jesus? And so that's what I say. Read the book, because that's the author's intent. And who's the author? The author is God. Yeah. And that is an infallible, inerrant, yep. sufficient, complete revelation yep. of Jesus Christ. What more do you want to know? Yeah. What more do you want to think about Jesus? Why would you want to look at Jesus in a different way? Right. Because you know that fallible man is taking the infallible word and he's dramatizing it. He's being create, taking creative license with it. Mm-hmm. And that's all fine and good for a secular book like Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. But when you're talking about the word of God, yeah. and then of course, you know, it has Jesus making jokes and Jesus saying things that he's never said. 
Now that's adding to, if you're taking that as good as scripture, mm -hmm. you're adding to scripture. And so yeah. I think the chosen is very dangerous because it skews the picture or, or, and if you say, well, it helps me better understand, then you're saying that you need something outside of divine revelation yes. to show you what God would want you to know. Yeah, and that's a problem, I think, with a lot of believers today um, because they don't understand the power and the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. And you know, I see it in the realm of parenting all the time, right? God has blessed our church, much like yours. We have a lot of young families in our church. And um, they're always wanting to read books on parenting, always wanting to read books on parenting and, and go from this book to that book to this book, from this mommy blogger to that mommy blogger. And when you tell them, listen, you need to just get in the Word, and the Word is authoritative, yeah. and the Word is sufficient to teach you how to parent. Well, it doesn't cover this topic, it doesn't cover that topic. No, you don't understand how the Word of God works. The Word of God works in conjunction with the Spirit of God to sanctify the believer so that it affects every aspect of your parenting. Exactly. It, it leads you then to be able to lead your, your family into godliness. And uh, yeah, if they're saying it doesn't you know, handle this or it doesn't handle that, may, maybe not specifically, mm -hmm. but when you look at it in its totality and you allow the Word to do the work in your life, then all of a sudden the way that you approach the parenting task is very, very different. Right. And so uh, this is a, I don't know about your church, I know in my church, and I think in, in Christianity in general, um, we see uh, people who don't understand necessarily the authority, the sufficiency, the clarity, uh, the inspiration of Scripture, and how that it really is to be formative in our lives, that God uses the Word by the Spirit to transform us. Absolutely, and we often say here, and I actually just said it in a, a different podcast, by the way, if you guys hear background noise, we're in the middle of where we're wrapping up a conference. We have a lot of kids running around, and so I it's love just it. there's there's one now. Yep, it, it's just impossible to to, <laughs> to do without them. So so forgive us, but we love having kids around. Yep. But uh, what we say here oftentimes is the Bible is not the gospel. The Bible, which I mean, it's all encapsulated. Yep. Uh, it's not just the words of life. It's the words for life. Mm -hmm. Everything you need to know. Yep. Everything everything you need to live, and it's it's. As you said, it's spirit-fueled in the life of the spirit-filled believer. Yeah. And it, it its principles expand yep. to all aspects of our lives. Yep. Just so, you know, we, we can look at things and we say, well, that's not specifically outlined. No, but obedience to Christ's commands and living a God-pleasing, spirit-filled life is. And just ask yourself, is that conducive to such? Yes. And so, yeah, I, sola scriptura applies to the whole life. Correct. Yeah, no question. Yeah. So God revealed in Christ. There was another thing that you said, and it's it slipped my mind now because we we hung on to the chosen, which again, <laughs> no, it, it's really something because truth, truth to heart, chosen isn't truth, and we want to no. expose things as being wrong. No matter, it may hurt your feelings. You may like it, but that's not a fit representation of Christ. And if we're going to represent anything or anyone per, as best we can. We need to go to the to the original source material, yes. Yes. and that's the Word of God for everything. So Christ's glory, the fullness of of um, He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is full of grace and truth, and I like. And you touched on it. Um, we've been talking about all of God's attributes, and they're incomprehensible. Oh, I know what I wanted, to, and this this goes into it. Uh, it it agrees with it, which is why it just came to my mind. Um, you said that people say, and I've heard this, whether you said it, I, I've heard it also, it's, I see Jesus as being like me. Yeah. But that's, I get it. He is in the sense that he's a man of flesh and blood. Yeah. Uh, again, the hypostatic union, but he's not like you and me. No. He's not, he's not crass. He's not fallible. He's not sinful. He's not, uh, he's not a clown. He's not like you and me. So we, we don't need a Savior who's like us in that regard. Mm -hmm. We need a Savior who is exemplified and exuding mm -hmm. holiness, uh, sovereignty, um, uh, love, yes. all of these things that that we we may experience some of these things imper imperfectly, mm -hmm. but He is definitely not like us in that He embodies them perfectly. Yeah, He, he didn't come so that He could get us. Right, mm -hmm. and and again, that was a kind of a 
grenade at the, I'm glad the multi-million dollar ad campaign because yeah, those ads drive me insane mm-hmm. um, because they reduce the sinless, glorious Christ to just human and that he gets us. And, and, and they ignore entirely his omniscience in that he did not, he was not before the incarnation familiar with the intricacies of, of human life. Of course he was. Of course he was. Mm-hmm. He knows all things. Now, had he experienced those things personally as a man? No, not necessarily. But a lot of times we we jump onto and and kind of grab onto texts like Hebrews where he was tested like we are in all points and did not sin or go to Isaiah 53 where uh, he's a man of sorrows and queen with grief. And and the way we look at those texts is like he didn't know anything about that before he got here. Right. Well, that would mean that then Jesus had to learn about those conditions. He knew those things in his pre-existence. He knew those things in his eternal nature, and he experienced them in a very real way on earth. But the idea that he came so that he could identify with us, or he came that he... No, he came to show us the Father. Right. And he made that very clear. Right. Um, And so it's... We have that that ad campaign, and um, I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars they spend on that thing. But again, they're not putting forth the true Christ. Right. They're putting forth their all the time. A lot of times, woke representation of Jesus. I would say they make Jesus an idol because at mm-hmm. the end of the day, what is an idol? But an idol is a construct of human imagination. Mm-hmm. It is. It is something. So it's just like it's just like what the Greeks did with uh, demigods. That's why Christianity is so unique, because Christian. That's why it can't be man-made because right. man could never conceive the idea of the hypostatic union of the yeah. Trinity, yeah. one and three, three and one. And so what what mythology has tried to do is they've tried to meld mankind with deity, and that they've made demigods, Hercules mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Achilles, and and some of these. And they ha- they have their flaws, they have their divine side, but then they have their mm-hmm. human side, and I think that's the same thing that people do with Jesus under the banner of Christianity. They take the God Man and they try to bring him to a level where they can not just understand him, right, but. Ident- as you said, identify with him, but in the wrong way. We want to be identified with Christ. Absolutely. When we're saved, we are identified with Christ, mm-hmm. but not by bringing Christ to our sinful level, right. but by being conformed to his image, not conforming him to our image. And so I would say that that the Jesus of the chosen is just a human construct. It's an idol. Yeah, we can't even begin to conceive of the sinless Son of God. We, we can't... We don't know what it's like to not sin for a day, right? Uh, we don't know what it's like to have every one of our motives be entirely pure oh, at no. all times. We, we can't even begin to conceive of that. And so instead of then just submitting and subordinating ourselves to the truth of Scripture, what do we do? Well, now we're going to make a Jesus that's more like us than what he actually was. Was he fully human? Absolutely, 100%. But was he other than us? Yes, 100%. Mm-hmm. And so we don't sacrifice one for the sake of the other. We, we have to realize that both are entirely true um, and, and then worship the God who is. Yeah. And we don't, we don't get to determine our truth when it comes to Jesus. Right. Uh, whether it's the chosen or the, the ad campaign, he gets us. We don't get to determine our truth when it comes to Christ. There, there is the truth of Christ and he himself is the truth. Mm-hmm. And... Our job is to simply uh, bow before him right. and to submit and subordinate ourselves to him. And, you know, I tell people all the time, uh, if you're looking, and you alluded to it earlier, if you're looking for understanding and if you think that understanding some of these things uh, is going to bring comfort or peace to your soul, number one, we're not called to understand them. Right. Should, we, should we study them? Should we understand them to the best of, of our ability, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Word? Absolutely, we should. Um, but the comfort comes in trusting, mm-hmm. and it comes in that faith. And I don't know how the hypostatic union works. I, I don't know um, how uh, any of this actually works. And I find great comfort and trust and, and, and peace in trusting the one who does. Yeah, And it... 
he makes all these things work. And if, if he can make all of these things work, then, brother, I can trust him with my life. I can trust him with my children. I can trust him with my grandchildren. I can trust him with the church. I can trust him with everything mm-hmm. because his knowledge and understanding is so far uh, superior to anything that I have. Yeah, and that's for me. That's that's the comforting. That's one of the most one of the comforting things about our Lord. It's that I can understand. Yeah. Uh, because if I could understand God, as I said, I, I would be God, and I I want a God who's bigger than me. Um, I I need a God who's bigger than me. But whether I want or need, He is a God who's bigger than me. Yeah. And you said as far as Jesus, He He's other, and that's one of the things that uh, Foskey brought out in his sermon on holiness. Yeah. It's the holiness of God is God's otherness, yeah. and it's His transcendent quality, as, as Spur, or Sproul says, that He is on a on a plane of existence all on His own, right. high above everything. And Jesus exemplified that, and and I take great comfort in knowing that if God is reduced to my finite ability to understand Him, mm-hmm. then He's not a very big God. Yeah, yeah. And Alva did a great job today talking about that as well. Just you know the, the the bigness of God, and then in the incarnation, you know the the greatest being in all of eternity and time and space, universe, and then he condescended and and became a human embryo. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that that's who can understand that? Right, we can't. And, yeah. You know, he did a great job in, in Romans 11 pulling out that just the how God's ways are just beyond our capacity to understand. And, and uh, Fosky did great. Listen, people who know him only see him really as this funny guy on Twitter and TikTok. And, but that brother is a theologian, and he can preach. And he's very sober-minded. Too. Oh, very. And yeah. We, we actually talked about that in our podcast. I'd encourage you to listen to it. Uh, he talked about the importance of humor in the ministry but when you when I first met him, I was just I, I called Hannah. I'm like, this guy's this guy's humble and he's serious. Yeah, you know, he's serious. Yeah, yeah. But, humor in the ministry, man. If you can't laugh, you're not going to last that's very right. long in oh, yeah, this. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so yeah, we've had a great time here. Uh, I, I do appreciate again the way you brought that out. I would encourage our listeners because that is a discussion that people need to have. They they. The representation of Christ as the Bible portrays him, nothing more. Well, uh, let me scratch that. There's so much more to him Correct. than even yeah. he is revealed. Right. Uh, we, will, we will spend eternity trying, learning more and more about God, and we'll never fully comprehend God. And when that, that verse is, it, it really is an incomprehensible verse when it says that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeah. And you look and you can observe through the scripture. We see his holiness and and not sinning. We see his his power and raising the dead, as you said, his sovereignty and yep. calming the storms. You see all of his attributes displayed, mm-hmm. but you don't see their fullness. No. And you'll never see their fullness. Mm-hmm. But to look at a man of flesh and blood and say the fullness of God dwells in him. I don't. I. I. I'll, I won't be able to see that, yeah. and I'll be gazing, beholding my God. I'll be gazing at Him eternally, because, uh, you know, we're 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 going to see God through Christ in heaven, right? I mean, He is our He is our King. He yeah. is our mediator. He is our intercessor, and we're going to bow before Him as His bride, um, and we'll never see the fullness of Him. Though we'll see a, a we'll we'll be like Him. We'll right. be glorified like Him. But we won't be him. Well, this is our this is our great comfort and hope, right? And that one day we will see him as he is. Mm-hmm. That one day uh, that that we will be face to face with him, and, and we'll behold him, and we'll have the opportunity. Right now, we behold him through the Word of God, mm-hmm. right? But one day we will behold him like John beheld him. One day we will behold him like the disciples and those who walked on earth and believed in him saw him. And you know, I, I just think that. We could probably gaze uh, admiringly upon him for all of eternity and still not exhaust the vastness of who he is. And and but I'm I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do yeah, so. Looking forward to try. And, and you said as John beheld him, uh, there's an old and maybe I'm just splitting hairs and and maybe you like the song. I mean it's it's an okay song, 
what is the song? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Oh yeah, yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Will yeah. I dance? I don't think you're going to just get up there and start dancing before Jesus. I think. I mean, what did what what did Isaiah say when when he saw the Lord? Woe is me. I'm undone. What did? And, and I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm being nitpicky. But when John was taken up and he saw he saw Christ, mm-hmm. what did he do? I mean, he he fell as a dead man before him. That was passage B. So passage A that I was studying was. John one okay. passage B was Revelation one. Okay, and uh, coming from two two separate places, but um, I, I love the description of Christ in Revelation. It's a powerful description, and I think it's a rev, uh, a description that we need to familiarize ourselves with, especially in these days where we're tempted to put way too much stock and um, trust and hope in politicians. Mm-hmm. And you know politics and things like that. I, I think it's good just to look at the the risen Christ that John saw in his vision and realize that he did exactly what you said. He fell down as a dead man. But then again, we see so one of the commonalities between John one and Revelation one is this focus on grace. Because when John fell down as a dead man, Jesus comes and puts his hand mm-hmm. upon him and offers him grace and mm-hmm. and shows that you know he he was not going to. Kill him, right? right. Uh, essentially, and so we see this this powerful uh, description and outpouring of grace there as well. Yeah. So maybe he will dance. But maybe we'll dance. I, I, you don't want to see me dancing. So, um, <laughs> and I don't even think a glorified body is going to help that. That's, honestly, that's, I don't think so. Either. It's bad. I don't know. I just I think that we need it when we think of Christ and we yeah. think when we see him. Yeah. I, I think that we will be overcome with just a sense of awe. Well, show me one person in Scripture who, when confronting or being confronted by God or the risen Christ, mm-hmm. strolled up to him casually. Right. You know, nobody does. Isaiah, the, the holiest prophet, right, in Israel's right. history, woe is me, I am undone, literally means I'm coming apart. Right. I'm being torn apart. Mm-hmm. I'm being ripped apart because I'm a man of unclean lips dwelling among a people of unclean lips. And Saul, right, powerful Pharisee, mm-hmm. um, when he confronted, when he was confronted by the risen Christ, he couldn't stay off the ground. Right. John, same thing. And uh, if these these men uh, were on their face before Christ, then one day we most certainly will be as well. And then every knee will bow and every tongue will confess right. that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's not a forced confession. It's just basically yeah. the idea is when you are, when all of humanity is finally confronted. With the glorious Christ, the the only thing they're going to be able to do is humble themselves before Him, bow before Him, acknowledge that He is who He is. Uh, that's a lot of times it's read or preached as like a forced confession. No, 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 it's not forced. Right. They just can't do anything else but that. Right. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Right. Well, it's been good. I, I appreciate you coming in. I, I'm I'm hearing. Somebody playing music in the background, so yep. maybe that's our, our cue. <laughs> like at the Academy Awards, all right, it's time to time to be done. Get off the stage. But I appreciate again Matt Keller at Cross Point Westerville, Ohio, and he's been faithful there for 15 years. He and his wife, uh, lovely wife, have joined us uh, this this weekend, and we're looking forward to uh, some time together in the future. Absolutely, look forward to it. All right, thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Oh, like, share, subscribe, comment down below. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Thanks, brother.